This is really, really exciting open source information at the ICC, and that stands for the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And we have somebody who is familiar with that, who knows about um, open source information, and information plays a role in the investigation of war crimes and atrocities. Uh, this is really important, and it's really new, and it's really something at the cutting edge, especially now in Ukraine. And I give you Sylvia Ottonetti in Oaxaca, Mexico. Hi, Sylvia. Hello, Jay. Thank you for having me. Well, sure. So Project Expedite Justice is into technology, information technology, and investigation. And all those things go together. Uh, so I want to know, you know, what kind of information technology can you use to investigate a war crime? This is really important. It takes us to a new level, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed, the technology and accountability for international crimes, uh, uh, as well as other types of crimes, uh, are going hand in hand more and more these days. Uh, and an incredibly, uh, in, in, in so persons investigations have become an incredibly uh, useful method of investigation. It is getting traction uh, both among the NGOs uh, and the prosecutors, domestic and, uh, and international. Um, so, Open source investigation, like the relevance of open source investigation uh, is uh, the potential uh, that it uh, uh, represents uh, for um, prosecutions of atrocity crimes. Uh, prosecution of atrocity crimes are a very difficult endeavor and uh, um, a myriad of issues have hindered uh, the effective prosecution of uh, perpetrators of atrocity crimes at the ICC. Uh, these are security threats to investigators, uh, lack of access to the territories, uh, often because uh, um, state authorities uh, refuse cooperation, as well as intimidation of witnesses. Uh, and all of this is worsened uh, by uh, the financial limitations uh, that the court uh, is faced with, uh, given such a broad geographical scope. So when you think about it, like the court has a monumental task. Uh, um, it, potentially universal jurisdiction uh, and high threshold for com uh, conviction really makes uh, make the uh, its job very difficult so, um so like this is where open source uh, information comes in right um it has created new opportunities to address uh, these shortcomings uh, of international criminal justice um, and uh, while not being a, a novel concept uh, because of the uh, open source investigation, uh, open source information has long been used uh, um, uh, by courts, uh, uh, including the, the ICC through NGO reports. Uh, now, like the, um, the coming of the digital age and uh, the uh, huge amount of material that is constantly posted on the internet uh, represents uh, a new potential for the court. Uh, is open source invest information is now turning uh, increasingly into digital open source uh, information. So in the past couple of years, uh, we've seen many actors um, that have started engaging with uh, open source uh, uh, investigations to demonstrate uh, uh, the commission of uh, human rights violations. Uh, and this has produced a sort of democratization of justice uh, where not only uh, state enforcement, state or international enforcement authorities uh, um, participate in investigations, but where any individual like provided that they have a laptop and an internet connections are, connection are able to, to find this information um, so, yeah, mm, uh, particularly in the context of Ukraine, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is uh, uh, a field of growing relevance. Uh, uh, for the first time, uh, well, also in Syria, open source investigations played a big role, but in Ukraine, this role is, uh, is growing uh, um, to another level. We've seen so many um, uh, NGOs uh, and uh, other individuals in civil society engaging in, uh, in these investigations. Um, some examples, for instance, are the use of satellite images uh, um, that can be used to prove uh, um, different crimes. Uh, for instance, uh, in uh, Mariupol, a satellite image uh, um, which shows like the Russian word for children uh, on uh, um, uh, written on the sides of the theater uh, can be used to prove uh, um, that uh, um, the perpetrators have knowledge uh, of, of the presence of civilians. Uh, 
which in the end mean that they violated the principle of, uh, of distinction, which is a very important principle of international humanitarian law, and consequently, consequently committed a war crime. Other examples uh, are satellite images of, uh, of Bucha um, that can show um, that uh, um, the Russian statements uh, claiming that the bodies uh, had appeared after uh, the Russian retreated from the area were actually um, were actually untrue and uh, and can help yeah, disprove uh, disprove these statements. Um, this was also these methods were um, in the context of Ukraine also pioneered uh, by Bellingcat. Uh, in the context of the MH17 investigations uh, um, a couple of years back, uh, as well as also um, already like in 2014 in Crimea. Another just gaining more and more traction, and we've seen also a lot of uh, Ukrainian uh, um, organizations uh, involved uh, um, in, um, uh, in these investigations, including uh, True Sounds, for instance. Uh, it's uh, it's one of uh, the, the main one in, uh, in this field. Oh, Bellingcat. Um, Bellingcat was uh, on 60 Minutes two weeks, a couple of months ago. That was very oh, interesting. Yes. And Bellingcat, um, you know, does, does great work, right? It, yeah, uh, indeed. It, it finds this information, turns it over, makes, makes it public, open source, and it can be used. Uh, uh, and I, you know, it's worth supporting Bellingcat and organizations like that. Um, but is, are there others like that? Are there others like Bellingcat? Well, there are a variety of organizations, uh, some bigger, others smaller. A lot of um, also the advocacy focused organizations still engage to an extent uh, uh, in open source investigations. But obviously, the standards uh, um, that will be uh, put in place uh, when investigating for the purpose of prosecution are also different than those uh, put in place for the purpose uh, of uh, of advocacy of human rights advocacy. Other um, uh, other great projects or uh, organizations are, for instance, uh, Situ uh, that employs uh, satellite and social video uh, to create a virtual reality and three uh, D building reconstructions. And those can be uh, used to establish the commission of crimes. Um, other organizations such as uh, Witness uh, or Videre Spedere uh, specialize uh, in equipping the, the communities uh, uh, in the hard to access areas uh, with the technology that is necessary, uh, technology and training necessary to produce uh, video evidence effectively. Um, and uh, while not an NGO, the Human Rights Center um, of UC Berkeley has also been a, a great player in these developments. Uh, they've organized trainings and workshops uh, with NGOs and professionals, uh, also including um, international uh, criminal investigators. Um, and their uh, most important contribution is uh, certainly uh, the well-known Berkeley Protocol on digital open source investigation, um, which was done in collaboration with uh, the uh, UN Human Rights Office. Um, and the protocol um, is actually like a great source uh, for NGOs uh, and private investigators, uh, as well as, of course, uh, authorities that engage uh, in, uh, in these activities because it establishes guidelines uh, that can be used by this investigators to identify, collect, uh, preserve, uh, verify, and analyze uh, the information. And these overall, like, these are in, in essential steps uh, in uh, the investigation cycle that if performed uh, correctly, can guarantee that the evidence uh, uh, gathered can actually be used. Uh, well, that's a big, uh, that's a big issue. So. You know, open source, um, at least theoretically, can come from anywhere. Open source can come from sources that are questionable. There is a yeah. lot of questionable information on open source. Um, but it, you know, it's gratifying to hear that while uh, Mr. Putin uses technology to confuse and bamboozle people in Russia, um, you know, and, and other uh, autocrats do the same. Um, in this case, uh, open source is being used to prosecute them. However, if I'm a judge on the ICC, I need to be satisfied that this information is authentic, that it hasn't been manipulated, uh, that nobody has, um, you know, created it out, out of whole cloth. I need to know that it's accurate. I need to know that the people who have gathered it are responsible um, journalists and uh, technology people who are not, you know, handing me handing me inaccurate information. 
So how does that work in court? This is evidence we're talking about, evidence that could put people in jail or even have them executed. Um, and so the question is, how, how can we be satisfied that this open source information is legitimate? Yeah, well, of course, uh, Jay, as you said, uh, um, the yeah, admissibility of uh, open source evidence in the courtroom is uh, one of uh, the crucial uh, issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, um, for, to be admissible in the courtroom, uh, the evidence must be relevant, uh, have probative pro value, and its probative value must uh, outweigh any prejudicial effect uh, on the suspect. Uh, uh, it must not breach any rights of, uh, of the suspect. Um, uh, and this means that it's an incredibly challenging uh, task to the investigators, especially considering uh, that every minute uh, more than 500 hours uh, of content is uploaded on YouTube. Um, and uh, in insane amount of photos and videos are posted on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, on Twitter. And uh, of course, the investigators uh, are challenged uh, um, to ensure the authenticity and uh, uh, the reliability of this evidence. Uh, uh, this is why verification uh, is uh, an essential step uh, in, um, in the open source uh, um, investigation cycle. And... Uh, um, um, well, like, well, if I'm in court, yeah. if I, yeah. you know, let's, let's make a, a, you know, a theoretical case study. I'm in court yeah. and I'm prosecuting somebody and uh, I have, uh, for example, satellite information that I got from mm -hmm. somebody, maybe Bellingcat, who knows what, um, and, I, and I submit it to the judges in the ICC in The Hague. Um, what, what, kind of, uh, uh, what kind of legal protocols have to take place before the judges are satisfied? What kind of questions do they, do they ask? And what kind of answers does the prosecutor present? That's actually a very good question and a question that also needs to ad be addressed at the ICC level, because while there has been some use uh, of uh, open source information in ICC prosecutions, um, it's still rather undeveloped. Uh, um, and there are no like strict public uh, guidelines uh, on how this evidence uh, is, uh, is assessed. Uh, on how the authenticity of this evidence is assessed. Uh, so that's indeed something that the court uh, needs to work on. Also the judges needs to, need to be trained uh, and the prosecutors as well um, uh, to also know how to, um, uh, like what the verification process of this evidence entails, uh, uh, because otherwise they won't be able even to understand uh, um, like whether uh, the evidence was, that was uh, taken from uh, um, from a source uh, that is independent, impartial, and also like understand also the, the content, uh, uh, the technical content of uh, the piece of information, such as the metadata uh, included in, um, in the picture or, or video. Um, so there are like a series uh, of, uh, of steps, of course, uh, that um, um, have been, uh, um, um, have been like elaborated uh, particularly by the Berkeley Protocol and efforts like uh, on like how to verify um, this source, uh, uh, this, uh, this piece of evidence. Uh, and that includes both uh, an analysis of the source, which needs to be independent, impartial. You want to understand like whether they're affiliated uh, to any side uh, of the conflict, uh, but also requires a technical analysis, uh, uh, which as I was saying, uh, uh, it includes a metadata analysis uh, and uh, source code, uh, um, and uh, and then a content analysis uh, uh, where you assess the truthfulness of this content, uh, um, perhaps through geolocation, chronolocation, uh, and you assess the overall consistency of this piece of evidence. Yeah, so that you know, I think we need to uh, uh, deal deal with the issue of admissibility as it exists in. Classical courts and the courts, for example, of the United States, where there are certain rules that you know that apply before the evidence will be admitted. And you know, although um, judges and jurors are capable of examining circumstantial evidence, um, they're sometimes reluctant to do that. And you know, that's one of the things that Donald Trump takes advantage of. Um, you know, he escapes many times because circumstantial evidence is not good enough to satisfy the trier of fact. However, um, if you have data and analysis tools, um, and it's not only, I, I'm gathering from what you're saying, Sylvia, 
it's it's not only the open source data, it's the data analysis that counts. Uh, when you take the data analysis, you can make some really powerful conclusions. They may be circumstantial, but in our world today, a lot of a lot of proof is circumstantial, and we have to trust the tools um, to give us reliable answers. Um, looking, this is like a AI, right? Artificial intelligence. We have to trust those tools to give us, um, you know, reliable conclusions, um, which are essentially circumstantial. Um, so, if I'm a judge in the ICC in the Hague, I have to be Akamai. You know that word? That's not that's not a Spanish or Italian word. Akamai. <laughs> I have to be trained, intelligent. I, I right. have to I have to understand at a, at a, at a significant level of understanding. What's going on? I have to know about those tools. I have to know what you are doing when you are gathering data open source. I have to know what you are doing when you apply those tools to analyze the data and come to me with you know, conclusions based on that uh, analysis, maybe AI analysis. I have to be able to test um, your tools and your analysis if I am going to accept that evidence, the circumstantial evidence, uh, that data analysis evidence, as um, reliable. So this takes the court, the judges to a new level, am I right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Compared, well, compared to the um, uh, US system, the um, admissibility of evidence, the, admissibility, uh, the rules of admissibility of evidence, the International Criminal Court are a bit more lenient uh, and way more like up to the judges, the uh, judgment. <laughs> um, but, it's, like, uh, it's like the civil law system, right? It's up to uh, the judge to make a finding on the basis of everything the judge knows in the world. And he's not locked into, or she is not locked. I say she because there's a lot of women judges in Europe, <laughs> maybe more than in the US. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and um, you know, that, that, that person um, has, to, has the power in the, civ in the civil law system in Europe, which I think is largely adopted by the ICC, uh, to make a, a, a judgment based on what the judge knows and what the judge feels and all of the judge's experience, rather than finding chapter and verse, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and this is why uh, training these judges is, uh, is particularly essential. And these are the steps that have been taken uh, by the SEC to an extent uh, that has been uh, uh, cooperating with a number of, uh, of organizations, including uh, the Berkeley Human Rights Center that I mentioned, but as well as the the, I, the uh, Bellingcat uh, that is part uh, of uh, their technology advisory board. Uh, um, so there is uh, indeed like a willingness uh, of the court uh, to also make use uh, of uh, of specialized uh, NGOs. Uh, um, uh, to to un better understand and better use uh, open source uh, um, information uh, at trial. Yet, like uh, um, full cooperation with NGOs is still rather problematic uh, to some extent, uh, and because uh, it might exacerbate uh, some of the challenges that, that open source uh, uh, investigations already pose uh, to even uh, even the prosecutor. You know, I, I imagine. Tell me if this is accurate or, or not. Uh, I imagine that open source also includes somebody doing research on open source information that is newspapers, uh, articles, um, journals of all kinds, academic journals, public journals, from one end of the spectrum to the other, and picking up information, events, names, places, data. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, the black box technique that the U.S. used um, after 9-11, which was only yesterday. Um, and 9-11 uh, um, showed us that we could do data analysis by looking for keywords in printed material. Uh, and then we could uh, examine um, how many times a given keyword popped up how many times it appeared next to or close by the name of another, say, suspected terrorist, uh, and, and, and made conclusions on that basis. And, and by the same token, you could have somebody, anybody, me, you, anybody from Project Expedite Justice, sit at a computer 
and do this kind of black box research and with the right software connect up this name and that name and make a case and make a case based on that. Um, of course, that person has to be credible. Uh, that person has to be, uh, you know, uh, informed and educated about how to do this. But if that person came to me as a judge, if I, assuming for a moment I'm a judge at the ICC, and said, look, I, you know, I did some um, data gathering from open source materials all over the world. Um, I checked this, that, and the other thing. Here's what I found. And this is the software I used to connect up the keywords. And this is the conclusion I drew. And these are the algorithms by which I drew that conclusion. Uh, I would be I would be impressed, and I would treat that as reliable if the individual and his organization or her organization was reliable. Uh, so you know, in the case of Project Expedite Justice, um, you know they could go anywhere, do anything, and they could do it in uh, uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, for example, um, and learn a lot of things about a lot of people without even standing up. And then they could analyze that data as open source, open information, okay, and submit it to a prosecutor for him to submit it or her to submit it to a judge in the ICC. Is this happening? Should it happen? Is it yeah, valuable? This is, yeah. uh, this is happening. This is very valuable. And uh, I think it should happen even more frequently, uh, provided that like some uh, issues are addressed. Uh, and as you said, uh, anyone can do it. But not anyone will know uh, the investigative principles and standards that they're required to comply uh, with uh, in order to then eventually, um, uh, their, like for their evidence to eventually end up in court. Uh, so this is actually a huge problem amongst NGOs, uh, even because uh, while some uh, have developed uh, all this knowledge. Uh, um, others uh, are still employing uh, a, a methods that are typical of advocacy, and they won't. Uh, they don't require to comply with the strict standards that are instead required for for prosecution. Um, very important, as you were also saying, is the transparency of the methods utilized. Uh, so, if you are able to show how you reached a certain conclusion and the judges uh, and the defense, and everyone will be able to trace back your steps and understand your reasoning throughout it. Um, this means that um, the, the evidence will likely be easier to authenticate uh, and uh, will be deemed uh, more reliable. Um, however, like specific guidelines uh, on how to uh, conduct open source investigations uh, for the ICC are largely lacking. Uh, there are some guidance, uh, guidelines that the uh, court has developed uh, within the prosecutor's office, uh, but there is definitely a need to uh, better standardize this framework and make it available to individuals that want to contribute uh, to, well, eventually to international criminal justice. Um, what really uh, strikes me is that we have right in front of our eyes, you know, on a daily basis, we have war crimes and crimes against humanity going on in Ukraine. Um, you know, the, the whole study of Buka uh, is not yet done. Um, and um, we, we have a lot of people in Ukraine doing research, but we also have a lot of people outside Ukraine doing research and finding out who's responsible for what uh, with the notion of bringing that before the ICC and other courts in the world. Uh, as violations of human rights, um, and so this is a this is a war that's different from all other wars. In that sense, we have not only Project Expedite Justice, but all kinds of other NGOs um, doing that kind of research with a view to presenting it to uh, tribunals that can hold people accountable uh, for war crimes. Um, and I, I think the world will never be the same. If you want to do war crimes, you're going to run into these organizations. And they will be able to get the goods on you, and they will be able to take you to. And so, it, you know, not only is it uh, uh, a discovery of sorts, another chapter of sorts, it's also a test, because we have to see the ICC actually take this data, take this evidence, and go somewhere with it, and actually hold these people accountable. Um, and that, you know, it may be a long road to do that, um, but that that's the test, and hopefully. You know, I can be, we can be optimistic that will happen. But here's one more step in it, Sylvia. And this is so interesting. This is a reinvention of criminal investigation. It's a reinvention of prosecution, not only for war crimes, 
But for any crime that involves, you know, a, a social violation, a violation of, of, of a larger law, a, a morality, a, you know, an ethical crime. Um, and I think in the future, this will be irresistible. Even in, in the United States, you know, where we have stare decisis and, you know, the rule of uh, precedent, and all that, and other countries in Europe, you know, UK comes to mind. Um, you know, our our legal our legal founders um, are in the UK, and so I think there may be a time in the not too distant future when what you are doing, what you are talking about, uh, may have an effect on the classical mode of criminal investigation, criminal justice, because you know it's it's hard to prosecute sometimes. And 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 the criminal has the advantage, in a in a demographic sense, and get away with things. Um, and people will say to me, "Oh no, Jay, no, no, no. We have to have our you know constitutional rights and all that." And the and the question is whether you can put the constitutional rights together with open source investigation. You think you can? Um, I think so. Yes, uh, for sure. Like uh, there are. Um, um, there are issues that need to be safeguarded uh, by NGOs that are conducting these investigations, especially like the risk of our constitutional rights are particularly prominent when NGOs are uh, involved. Uh, um, again, because uh, of uh, um, the guidelines, the lack of guidelines uh, and lack of, of knowledge as to the proper processes, proper uh, legal processes uh, to, to follow throughout their investigation. Well, I think that provided that a framework, had an effective, uh, comprehensive framework uh, on uh, how to conduct these investigations in compliance uh, with uh, with constitutional rights, uh, with the rights of the defense, uh, and uh, all those that are involved, uh, is something that is possible and uh, and potentially very beneficial to international criminal law, as you said, or law like uh, justice in general. Um, well, let me ask you about this, you know, language. You know, I, I remember our earlier discussion where I was charmed to find out that you're Italian. You speak Italian. Uh, at the time you were living in Madrid, so you had to learn Spanish. Uh, let, me, let me say Spanish, Spanish. And now you're in yes. Oaxaca <laughs> and, and you're learning South American Spanish. And that's not exactly the same, not exactly the same as Spanish, Spanish. And it raises the question, of, um, of language. You know, if I'm one of these researchers and I'm dealing with multiple open source sources, um, I need to be able to speak many languages. I, I, can't, I can't just do English. English is simply not enough when you're, when you're trying to gather reliable sources from all over the planet. Uh, how does that work? How does that work in your observation of it? Um, do you need to have three, four, five, six languages to do this? Uh, how do you get across the language barrier? Yeah, absolutely. It is uh, it is something that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and generally, um, NGOs, uh, as well as the prosecutor, will have stuff that uh, uh, is multilingual. Um, and especially, it's especially essential, of course, uh, to have uh, stuff that is fluent in the language of the, the situation under of the country, the situation under investigation. Uh, uh, but also, um, oftentimes, uh, uh, translation software uh, can be of uh, very much help, uh, at least uh, for uh, preliminary investigation online and a preliminary research. Uh, uh, I have uh, used uh, uh, Google Translate or other translators uh, uh, to Google um, information in different languages. Uh, and then with a click, uh, you can translate the whole uh, page. Of course, uh, as you go on uh, in the investigative process, uh, uh, you need a more, a more a deeper understanding uh, of, of the language, uh, which can definitely be um, definitely be an issue, but um, multilingual stuff uh, is definitely the answer to that. Yeah, the other thing that flows out of that same line of thought is, um, you know, you don't have to be in Kiev um, to do this investigation. If you don't want to be in Kiev to do this investigation, although right now Kiev seems to be in better shape than it was a couple of months ago. Yeah, um, certainly. But, um, you know, of course, it's good to be on the ground, but 
if you're looking for open source data coming from any source, any language, any you know, any organization, um, you can, am I right? You can be anywhere. You can be in Hawaii. You can be in Oaxaca. Um, you can be anywhere you have broadband. And you can get on the machine. You can look at Google and other research uh, software. You can you can use that, um, you know, the special analysis AI kind of mm -hmm. uh, software. You just collect the data in a responsible database, and, and then you analyze it with responsible analytics. And before you know it, you have some really valuable information uh, that would be of interest to the judicial community, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm wondering, from your observation, uh, Oaxaca, uh, gee whiz, uh, uh, Bogota, uh, <laughs> anywhere, right? It could be anywhere, anywhere in the world, right? <laughs> anywhere with a stable internet co connection. And certainly, like, the advantage in terms of security is, uh, is notable. Because um, of course, like you, um, uh, you will not put the, the life of the investigators at stake, uh, at least in the first process. Oftentimes, uh, uh, open source uh, investigations do need to be complemented with investigation on the field, uh, but they provide uh, a very good uh, guidance and objective information that can be gathered from, from anywhere and be used to then corroborate uh, other types uh, of evidence that may be gathered on the field as well. Yeah, <clears throat> well, that, and that suggests that one of the things uh, in the future will be the the, uh, the corroboration. In other words, an organization that takes information that you have, uh, um, you know, accumulated, that I have accumulated, um, my analysis, your analysis, and and a dozen other people to another level, will a level where uh, somebody can uh, corroborate large conclusions. Um, based on a higher level of analysis, uh, with a lot of source, a lot of open source. Anyway, that you know, that's what comes to mind. But I wonder, my my last question to you, Sylvia, is uh, where do you see this going? Where do you see it going in terms of acceptance and reliability? Where do you see it going in the organizations that participate? The or, the uh, the software, the hardware, uh, the, the analytical software that you know will be in play, and the effect of it. Uh, on international justice? Where is it going, say, in five years? Well, I think the future is bright. Uh, um, a lot of organizations uh, and uh, domestic and international courts uh, have shown a willingness to use this type of information uh, um, and also willingness to, to adapt uh, uh, their frameworks uh, to this emerging type of information. Um, so, well, certainly, um, uh, the potential is uh, is is huge. Uh, um, some safeguards that need to be respected, uh, and there is a need, to, especially for the international criminal court, given also like the attraction that these investigations are gaining in Ukraine. There's a need to adapt uh, their their system, and uh, that includes uh, develop, adapting its tools uh, for receiving evidence uh, and for the preservation of evidence and uh, the presentation of evidence uh, at trial which are not often fine-tuned uh, to record all the data that is perhaps needed to, um, to prove the authenticity of a piece of evidence, uh, um, as well as like more and more softwares are being developed uh, by a variety of organizations, uh, including uh, apps that allow you to um, take uh, um, pictures and videos in uh, conflict areas, so pictures and videos of abusers, uh, and um, they will record uh, all the necessary data that then will be useful uh, for prosecution. One of these is the uh, eyewitness to atrocities. Uh, um, so certainly like uh, there is uh, an increasing uh, willingness uh, to rely on this. Uh, and uh, I think that as long as that um, keeps uh, gaining traction, uh, um, open source investigation will be able um, to not only corroborate, but perhaps even prove uh, more substantial uh, elements of crimes uh, in the future. Good for you, Sylvia. Good, good for Project Expedite Justice. I'm not going to ask you, <laughs> really, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you exactly what you're doing because uh, we've agreed that I wouldn't. Um, but let me say that well, whatever you're doing, we appreciate all of us. Uh, we appreciate um, you know the effort you're making everywhere in the world, um, and I, I kind of wish I was younger so I could be you. 
I want to be you, Sylvia. I want to do this. Uh, you know, if anybody has an interest in information technology and analysis of data, what a wonderful career this would make anywhere. It's exciting. <laughs> it is it's exciting. It's very exciting. <laughs> Sylvia Antonetti with Project Expedite Justice in Oaxaca, Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.